Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join us. Uh, in From the Legislative Building in Regina, we have Saskatchewan's Chief Medical Health Officer, Dr. Saqib Shahab, and Health Minister Paul Merriman. We'll have opening remarks from each of them, and then we'll have time for questions. Dr. Shahab. Thank you for joining us today. Today, Dr. Shahab is going to provide an update on the current case numbers and where things may be going in the next few weeks. Before he does that, I want to say a, a quick few words about vaccines. Near the start of this pandemic, I remember Premier Mo saying, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. That is still true today, and we still have a long way to go in this marathon. But even marathons have a finish line. And now we know where that finish line is. The finish line is when we have uh, delivered a safe, effective vaccine to a significant number of Saskatchewan's residents. That's where life can truly start getting back to normal. Saskatchewan Health and the SHA have already done a lot of work getting ready to deliver this vaccine. They will have a more detailed presentation on that plan sometime next week. For now, I want everybody to know we in Saskatchewan are ready to go. As soon as the federal government is able to start delivering the vaccine to us, we will be ready to deliver that to Saskatchewan people quickly and safely. This is a huge undertaking involving thousands of healthcare workers and other support staff, transportation, storage, and many other logistical issues. But let me assure you, we will be ready. Premier Mo and I have directed all necessary resources be directed to this effort. Based on the advice of public health officials, we will be prioritizing who will receive it first. There will be more detail on this presentation next week, but it's no surprise that we expect healthcare workers and the residents in our long-term care and personal care homes to receive the first vaccines. We do not yet have an exact timeline on when we will be receiving these vaccines. The federal government is now saying the first deliveries will be early in the new year. Saskatchewan's per capita share that we should be receiving in the first quarter of 2021 is about 180,000 doses, enough to vaccinate 90,000 people. This is just based on the deliveries from Pfizer and Moderna who have applied for their vaccine approvals. In the last few days, two more companies, AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, have also applied to have their vaccines approved. This could result in more vaccines being delivered even quicker. When that occurs, we will be ready to start receiving the shipments and we will also be ready to go. This is how we get back to normal in Saskatchewan. This is how our health system will get back to normal. This is how our economy will get back to normal. This is how our lives will get back to normal. It is quite literally the shot in the arm that Saskatchewan needs. And be ready to deliver that shot in the arm as soon as the federal government starts getting us that vaccine. Until then, we all have to keep following the public orders and guidelines to protect, protect ourselves and others. Keep physical distancing, wear a mask, wash your hands, limit your close contacts, and stay home if you're not feeling well. And follow the, good, the other good practices that we know to reduce the spread of COVID-19. It's how we keep ourselves and those around us safe. Thank you, Dr. Shahab. Thank you, Mr. So good afternoon, everyone. So I'll go over a few uh, key messages from my side, and then I'll quickly go over 
some updated epidemiology and modeling that I uh, promised I'll bring back uh, today. Um, so as we know, we've identified 238 additional cases today and sadly two more deaths in the past 24 hours, uh, meaning that we have lost 13 more Saskatchewan residents since Friday. And obviously, very difficult time for all of us and our sympathies with the families and friends of these individuals and everyone uh, mourning them now. And also, we need to recognize you know, all uh, the friends and families who have a loved one in hospital and the healthcare providers looking after them. Uh, this virus, we have seen impacts all of us in our workplaces, schools, and at home, including re those residing in care homes. I also, you know, I got several messages from family physicians that won't ask me to remind everyone that if you test positive, do contact your family physician by telephone. Uh, your family physicians can support you uh, through COVID symptoms. Uh, for most people, they are mild. You can stay home. You, 811 can advise you. But if you have other comorbidities, please do keep in touch with your family physician as well. Uh, they are in the best position to provide medical support. And obviously, you don't always need to see them in person. During that time of isolation, they can support you virtually. But obviously, if you need more urgent care, either Healthline or your family physician can advise you how and where to seek that. Uh, another question that is on everyone's mind is, of course, uh, what are the plans for the holidays for Christmas? And, uh, you know, traditionally that's a time to spend with family and friends and colleagues. At this point, it is hard to say if uh, any of the restrictions can be relaxed. Uh, we will have to monitor closely over the next two weeks, and obviously I'll bring back epidemiology and the modeling in one to two weeks. Um, but whatever the uh, plans for holidays, we have to recognize that it's very different from last year. And it's also very different from Thanksgiving. And, and Thanksgiving, our case numbers were around 50 a day, and we, had, we could gather up to 15. Right now, our case numbers are much, much higher, even if they go down substantially. I think we need to be cautious over the holidays, and, but we'll be able to say uh, what exactly can, uh, can happen safely beyond you know, uh, being within your immediate household at this time. Um, so with that, I'll maybe go over the modeling slides quickly. Uh, so as, um, as we discussed, that this is not a prediction. This is just models that show what could happen over the next weeks, two months. And it's, it is one source of truth that helps uh, uh, decision makers in government and the Saskatchewan Health Authority to plan for the near term future as well as the longer term future. And the goal is to use modeling as well as other tools to make the best policy, policy decisions based on public health information, but also uh, you know, keeping children in school as much as possible and of course not exceeding the health system's capacity to care for both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 patients. And we have to look at the long term, you know, uh, as well as the short term. So basically looking at the indicators quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the epi slides, they're all going to be online, but you know, we can see our uh, case numbers are increasing. Um, they, if we look at a comparison with other uh, other uh, provinces, we are the third highest in terms of uh, active cases per 100,000 and also the third highest in terms of uh, new cases per 100,000. And our trajectory, uh, if you look at the gra graph on, on the right, if you compare the graph in Saskatchewan with other provinces, our trajectory is still going up. Uh, in some other provinces to, towards the east and towards the west, the trajectory is slowing down, but ours is slowing going up, and we can't see, and, and I'll show a bit more on the modeling slides, but it is still going up. So I think we need to be very careful for the time being. We need to observe all the additional uh, orders and guidelines that are put in place on fr uh, Friday, uh, November 27th, and I'll show a bit more with the modeling about what kind of impact we're seeing from that, as well as from the earlier um, uh, um, uh, 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 public health orders around mask use from uh, November 19th. Um, this just shows that uh, when adjusting for population, transmission is happening throughout the province. Um, COVID transmission is not localized to any one part of the province. 
Um, if you look at our cumulative hospitalizations, obviously, um, and they've gone up to 329 ever hospitalized, 84 in ICU, and 53 deaths. Uh, this number was up to date since yesterday. Uh, so unfortunately, 53 deaths. And, um, and if you look at our uh, rates in terms of hospitalizations and deaths, really it impacts all age groups, but uh, hospitalization we have seen in all age groups, but certainly it picks up 40 and older, and deaths unfortunately we have seen in all age groups 20 and older, but certainly 60 to 79, 2% uh, of all persons who get COVID, unfortunately, um, there's an uh, outcome is, uh, you know, uh, unfortunate. And 18 over, it's 7% of all cases, the outcome is unfortunate. So again, you know, protecting the most vulnerable by age and by comorbidities continues to be important. And even as vaccine becomes available, till such time that we have the majority of our population vaccinated, it's critical that we follow the guidelines, uh, uh, keeping our numbers low overall, but also protecting the most vulnerable based on age as well as underlying risk factors. I will not spend a lot of time on um, these slides. Uh, this, this is the current hospitalization uh, in ICU, um, which again shows that you know we have hospitalizations in age, each age group, but ICU is more in the older age groups. Um, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on th these slides because that just shows the hospitalization rate. I'm just going to spend a bit of time on this slide because what this really shows is that we have seen outbreaks. These are outbreaks of the last two months, and we have seen outbreaks in all sectors. You know, we have seen them uh, in, in long-term care facilities increasingly. Obviously, we were seeing many outbreaks in sports teams, and that ha currently has been paused. Uh, we've seen a few outbreaks in gyms. We've seen a few in restaurants, but that's been more in staff, less transmission within the restaurant setting. But again, uh, you know, workplaces, obviously, all types of workplaces, office environments, manufacturing, uh, you know, pro uh, food processing plants. We've seen outbreaks in all sectors. And again, the message here is that some sectors that uh, were we were seeing quite a rise, you know, like sports have been paused. Uh, uh, the Ministry of Labor Relations Workplace Safety is there to support workplaces. There's guidelines for workplaces that are online. Um, there are supports there to facilitate quick isolation and contact tracing in partnership with public health. So, you know, workplaces are getting very good at quickly improving their pro uh, COVID protocols and quickly isolating uh, a case and if there's a close contact and minimizing that there would be a clo close contact in the workplace. So, I think there's some good uh, um, um, actions happening and there's some sense that over the last week we have seen less outbreaks in obviously the sectors that are not no longer allowed um, but we do continue to see small clusters obviously in immediate households and in workplaces that currently are open and that's important but just a caution for all of us to revisit how we go to work how we behave at work and and uh, you know how to keep our case numbers and content numbers small our testing numbers are continuing to rise and remain strong throughout Saskatchewan, and today there's announced drive-through testing in Prince Albert, so that's a backbone of our, um, you know, COVID offensive strategy. Um, our contacts are coming down, so this is really good news. Our close contacts per week have come down to 6.6 .6 from 7.8, so this is really good news. Um, our range of contacts is also coming down from up to one. It was as high as 200 two months ago to as high as 150 to as high as 112. And I'm really uh, uh, happy to announce that, you know, even for the high range of contacts, many of them are in situations where, you know, there were four or five classes that were impacted. So there may not be close contacts, but as a precaution, four or five classes have gone online. Not a high risk situation. We've not seen large outbreaks. And then there were a few situations where two or three teams or curling teams or curling events resulted in high number of contacts. Again, that's no longer happening at the moment. Uh, and then a few workplaces where there were maybe 10, 20 contacts. So we're obviously not seeing the large gatherings, which are no longer permitted. So th that's good news. And, and this is definitely having an impact on our case numbers. But again, you know, we do need to hold the line because we really need to bring our number of contacts even lower. I, I said, really, yeah, if you become a case today, you should not have 
many people beyond your immediate household who you can say was a close contact, closer than two meters, without a mask for more than 15 minutes. And if you may, uh, look back three days, because you are uh, uh, infectious for two days before you develop symptoms, and you realize you were in close contact, and that, that's a good opportunity to revisit your protocols and, and just improve your physical distancing and mask use and other behaviors at work or otherwise when you're shopping or in other settings. Um, our active case numbers are still high, 21.8 per 100,000. Uh, test positive rate is 7.6. So again, these are really important indicators. We really want to see both of them trend down, um, and they are continuing to be quite high overall. Um, and we'll have a, a bit more on, on the modeling slides on how that's behaving. So the top um, uh, graph is just a cumulative, so I think that is always going to go up. But if you look at the bottom graph, and you, you can see that the blue line is where we want to be. We want to be um, you know, less than uh, certainly um, uh, the modeling actually is seeing that if we continue without further measures, this takes into account the, uh, the orders of November 19th. In a week or two, I'll be able to present the impact of the orders on November 27th. But this shows that if we all comply with the orders, we can bring our case numbers down in December to below 400, which is important. But we still need to hold the course. Otherwise, the case numbers can rise in January. So again, the cautions around the holidays and why we can't really announce any relaxation of the holidays at this point. And even if there was some relaxation, it'll have to be a very cautious relaxation because the, the, uh, whenever you have a bit of a relaxation, you always see uh, the impact of that two or three weeks down the road. But again, I think where we want to be is the blue area at the bottom and certainly not the pink area. So if we hadn't taken any measures over uh, November, you know, we could very uh, well have been in the pink area, would, which would have been very concerning. Uh, and then if we look at this graph, this is similar to the one uh, we showed uh, um, um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, the green stars uh, are the actual numbers that are showing that our case numbers are trending up uh, in a way that is uh, very, um, very uh, concerning. Uh, the orange stars towards the top show where we could potentially be without any public health measures. Um, we really need to make sure we don't hit those marks. We really we need to make sure we don't hit 300 to 400 cases a day. That would be quite concerning. So far, the news is mixed. Some days we have 300 cases. Sometimes we have you know, 180. Uh, there's variation on how many tests are done. But we average around 250 cases a day. We really need to bring that down. And again, all the actions we're taking are good, but we really need to keep doing that very consistently. And all of us need to do that, not 60%, 70%. All of us need to do that very consistently. Um, <coughs> And then, of course, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but these are the same graphs, in, but instead of showing uh, cases per day, they're showing uh, hospitalizations per day. So, you know, they predict you can, that if you do everything consistently, our hospital, hospitalization, which has a lag of two to three days, can, uh, two to three weeks after case numbers, can still go up for a while, and that will continue to put pressure on hospitalization and similarly um, um, on ICU capacity. So this, again, is showing that while the green uh, stars are bending a bit down ever so slightly, uh, the modeling is still predicting that they will continue to rise. Those are the orange stars, and we really don't want to go in that territory. We need to avoid going in that territory. Um, and similarly for ICU census, um, and you know, I think Mr. Scott Livingston and others will be able to speak further on that tomorrow, but certainly um, the Saskatchewan Health Authority is planning for at least the blue scenario, um, that if it gets to a higher demand on hospital beds and uh, ICU, but again, just because the planning is happening doesn't mean that it should be allowed to go to that level. We really need to stabilize our daily case numbers, and two or three weeks down uh, the road, that can have an impact on our hospitalizations and ICU. And this again is showing that um, this again is showing that you know there's a slight downward trend, but not certainly to the extent we would like to see. And finally, I'll just close with um, a couple of slides that 
this really shows that the the green is where we want to where where we are today and we want to be where the green is at the bottom we want to bend the curve uh, we don't want to bend the rules we want to bend the curve and follow the public health uh, orders and the reopen Saskatchewan updated guidelines so that we can stabilize over December early part of January and uh, the school break is another opportunity for us to slow things down to stabilize our numbers and so that we can go back to school in January with less pressure, less cases per day. And again, you know, while people are wondering whether we can meet uh, friends and family outside our household, again, we need to balance that with the risk of a rebound in January. Uh, so the greed is where we want to be. Um, we really don't want to be where the orange is. And the other thing this slide is showing that till such time that we are able to vaccinate a majority of the population, which really will hopefully start happening April, May. Till such time, every time we do all these specific restrictions, every time you relax, you see a bit of a rebound. So the rebound can be low in the green, but if we don't have any restrictions and then we tighten up too late, you know, we are in the orange area, our case numbers go to an unsustainable level, and then if you put restrictions, they go down, but then as soon as you relax a bit, they go up again, and that's really the orange area is unsustainable in terms of case numbers, uh, hospitaliz hospitalization, and ICU capacity. Um, so, so this slide really says that, you know, we really had to take action, significant action at uh, in November uh, on November 27, based on where our case numbers were. We couldn't have let case numbers go to, for example, 400 per day. And even now, we need to watch. I think we would at least need to continue at our current case numbers with our current measures, hope for some respite over school break when things really would slow down a bit. Um, <clears throat> but if our case numbers do unfortunately keep trending upward, I think we may have to look at even further restrictions. We hope we don't go there, but you know it's up to all of us actually to uh, you know keep uh, bending the curve down. This really shows us where you know it compares us with different provinces. So right now, like I said in that initial map, we are trending very much uh, towards a higher surge. There's some slight early signs this week that we are. Now, maybe plateauing, but we can't, uh, you know, rest on uh, our laurels on that. We really need to con consistently practice all the measures uh, as announced on November 27th. And this week and next week will be critical to see if we really are trending in a downward direction. And this just shows that, you know, we really, um, yeah, the restrictions, if they become quite significant, they're not forever. They can be relaxed for a bit. But, you know, overall, you know, we really can't loosen anything up till at least uh, April, May, till, you know, the majority of the population has been vaccinated. Could we go back to where we were in October um, in the terms of the restrictions in place there? That very much depends on do our cases come down to that below 120, preferably below 60, and and so we'll have to see how uh, our case numbers progress. And finally, um, you know, I think uh, you know there's guidelines that are quite detailed, and again, I encourage everyone to go back uh, to go and read them. There's some subtle changes for how to go to a restaurant uh, around retail activity. Um, you know, certainly if you look around, I think there seems to be a bit of a calmness in terms of less traffic in retail locations, and people going around more systematically. That's great. We just need to keep on that course. You know, go less frequently. By all means, support local businesses, shop locally, either through curbside pickup or in person, but go in a systematic way, go safely. Um, for restaurants, you know, order takeout, you know, go less frequently in person if you choose to go to a restaurant again. The guidelines are four people at a table, preferably from within your household. If you live alone, preferably the same one or two people. Um, and then greater separation among tables. At this time, we're not seeing any signals of concern from those sectors with the revised guidelines. Same with gyms, same with conditioning and training activities. We've had a few reports where there was a bit of a crowding in change rooms, for example or you know, parents sitting close together while children were having conditioning exercises. But overall, the conditioning exercise is designed to minimize transmission so that we don't have the transmissions we were seeing with sports teams you know, uh, over the last two, three weeks. So really, it is up to us to really 
see how low we can bring our case numbers over the next two to three weeks and see you know how that helps us to have a, you know a peaceful uh, holiday season that still you know whatever wherever case numbers are it will be a very different christmas from last year but you know we've learned how to remain connected virtually and be safe uh, even you know, within our households and 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 but we'll have to see what further uh, recommendations we can give in a week or two about christmas and the holidays and then of course in january when school starts again we again need to observe the same cautions over, over the second part of the uh, 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 you know of the winter until uh, spring comes and and we have more vaccine that's available thank you Thank you, Dr. Shahab. Thank you, Minister Merriman. Uh, we'll now move to questions. I'll just note that SHA CEO Scott Livingston is also available on the phone. We'll start in the room uh, with questions here. Um, Murray? Um, given that we're kind of stuck between Manitoba and Alberta right now, is there any realistic scenario given their case increase for us to be able to lower our case without taking action that involves uh, limiting um, uh, visits between provinces? And if that's the case, don't we have to start restricting, putting in restrictions now with the holiday season coming and people planning to go back to Alberta or go to Saskatchewan, etc. for for visits? I, I guess what I'm asking is the twofold question of whether we need uh, those restrictions right now is the only alternative to lower our numbers given Alberta and, and whether they need to be in, in, in place now. Yeah, so uh, that's absolutely right. We are not an island and we are part of Western Canada and the entire Western Canada has seen an upsurge. So again, my recommendation this time actually is that we need to have a very quiet Christmas and really uh, the ideal is limited to your immediate household. Um, certainly, interprovincial travel, unless essential, is not recommended, and many families are already making those plans that not to travel interprovincially uh, unless absolutely essential. Um, can we get together even as one or two households? It's too early to say. But I think we need to be very cautious because if we relax over the holidays while our case numbers are high, we'll pay the price in January. So again, I think we need to be very cautious at this time. Our numbers are much higher than we were in Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, we were very, our numbers are lower. We very cautiously had you know up to 15 people allowed, but in some cases, people went to multiple events, and we saw a bit of a rebound. And right now, a rebound would be much higher. So again, I think at this point, uh, most people should and are making plans of not visiting uh, 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 within other provinces and ha uh, having a quieter Christmas and holiday season. But even the ability to meet among close family, one or two households, I think at this point it's too early to say, but we do need to observe great caution. Would you contemplate a isolation order similar to what we've seen in the other provinces? I believe it's generally been 14 days if you cross over and, and whatnot. And if so, uh, how soon would you contemplate such a thing to perhaps discourage that kind of traffic that you you yeah. are? So right about? now. No gatherings outside a household of up to five are allowed. Um, I think w by isolation order you mean more of a lockdown, a circuit. If we have if other provinces have orders, have orders that if you go to visit another province, you have to quarantine. I see. Afterwards. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Is that something you would be yeah. willing to recommend? Or are yeah. You recommend? yeah, I think that's been in place in the Atlantic provinces. We haven't really had that in in Western Canada, so I don't think we would go there necessarily. I think really the be because we are integrated, you know, for, for work reasons and sometimes for essential family reasons. So I don't think we'll go that far. But the recommendation really is at this point to limit interprovincial travel unless absolutely essential. Another question in the room, Mark. Since the last modeling update, we've seen over 3,000 cases and over 20 deaths. Did we act soon enough to, to make sure that there is going to be an, uh, these restrictions are having an effect? So right now, you know, it is important to note that the modeling, uh, uh, which factored in the measures on October 19th, is saying, according to the modeling, uh, maybe a 30, 40 percent decrease in case numbers and uh, ICU admissions and hospitalizations. So again, I think the modeling is projections high, low, medium. Um, and obviously, those projections are based on what they are seeing from the data. Um, what I can say is that, you know, are we happy with 250 cases a day? I would say no. 
Uh, we would like to see cases below 120. Are we happy that we're not seeing 500 cases a day? Absolutely. But even though we're not seeing 500, that's not where we need to go. So I think we, we have to look at what we're actually seeing and what the modeling is saying. So there is some impact of the November 19th um, um, measures. We are hoping that the November 27th measures are going to have an enhanced impact. I'm already seeing that in terms of no, obviously no further outbreaks in sports teams. Some clusters relate to workplaces, but even there they are small clusters. Number of contacts are coming down. The range of contacts is coming down, but we need to really stay the course. Follow up, Mark? Um, how does the province plan to control COVID-19 outbreaks in long-term care facilities, and are there plans to implement frequent testing at those facilities for staff to, to ensure that, that they are safe? Yeah, I, I'll maybe make some initial comments, and uh, Mr. Livingston is on. He is, yes. And then uh, Mr. Livingston will add some or get some further information tomorrow. But again, I think long-term care staff have been working extremely diligently throughout the last 10 months, but unfortunately now with increased community transmission, we are seeing many outbreaks and unfortunately deaths in long-term care facilities, certainly personal care homes, you know, uh, the, the, gov the government is working very closely with personal care homes and trying to, uh, in enhancing their ability to, you know, manage cases and clusters. The Saskatchewan Health Authority is supporting personal care homes as well as long-term care facilities. It is very challenging. It's very challenging in terms of visitor restrictions. It's very challenging for residents who can't see the loved ones uh, when there's an outbreak it's challenging for staff and residents um, but you know it is something that we are now facing for the first time you know we didn't really see uh, any outbreaks significantly in long-term care personal care homes till now the last four weeks but it is something that uh, you know uh, as best as we can is, is being managed but it, it is something that I think is the most high risk uh, out of all the outbreaks that we're seeing in terms of um, impact on residents and staff and, and, and families. Um, I don't know uh, Mr. Livingston if you had anything to add? Yeah just a little bit Dr. Shahab but just to follow up that you know to remind folks that one of the reasons we're seeing this spread in long-term care is because of widespread community-based transmission and we continue to keep protocols in place to limit traffic as well as the screening of staff visitors appropriate use of ppe and to answer your question with respect to um, both resources around outbreak management we're looking at how we uh, build uh, immediately build a, a human resource pool to help support outbreak management in long-term care because it's something we're you know we've seen a lot of recently as well as with respect to testing yes uh, there is a testing pilot in place right now with eight long-term care facilities for some of the new testing devices, the uh, the Pan Bio and Abbott ID now. And uh, once we get through that pilot, we'll be expanding surveillance into long-term care uh, because that's what the pilot is in, is in long-term care, both staff and residents. And we'll be putting that surveillance in place, increasing our testing capacity to actually try and uh, identify cases early uh, to ensure that we keep those residents in long-term care as safe as possible. Take our next question, Stephanie. Yeah. Dr. Shahab, what would the seven-day average of daily cases have to be uh, in order for you to make a recommendation that we could loosen up some of the household gathering restrictions to allow people to get together at Christmas? So I think uh, I'll, I'll give you my preference, but then what does it have to be ultimately has to be a decision that is based on my recommendation, but uh, on the benefit of allowing loosening versus the risk down the road. So generally, and I've, I've always said, five cases per 100,000 lower is where we are comfortable and that's less than on average 60 cases a day. Anything between 60 and 120 we are in the concern area um, and right now we are at you know 20, 22 cases per 100,000 per day um, and then the challenge of course is that you know in the summer sometimes we would go up a bit but there's a localized outbreak. Um, right now it's widespread, it's uh, winter, and so all those factors actually make the same case numbers more concerning and harder to manage because, you know, um, uh, the transmission is, is happening much more easily. So that is predicted, the fall surge. We saw it a bit later than other jurisdictions, but that's exactly what is predicted. So again, I think we've all adjusted, you know, uh, the weather's been milder. We, uh, um, you see many people actually at least making the most of the mild weather and being outdoors more. But again, I think it is very challenging to get together with friends and family with the current case numbers. And, and certainly my 
preference is less than 10 per 100,000. But obviously, we have to look at other factors, and, and, and it's always a trade-off. If you allow a bit of a relaxation, if everyone complies and most people actually choose not to get together, then you may not see a bit of a rebound. But if most cases get together, there's high transmission, that will just accelerate the transmission. And again, you know, that, that is what the modeling and the epidemiology, unfortunately, signals. Follow up, Steph? Yeah, uh, to the minister, for the vaccine, uh, I guess, distribution rollout plan that we can expect to see next week, is there going to be a component of a, a, a misinformation education campaign? I mean, there's been people outside of the legislature, uh, even, you know, as soon as, yeah, far back as yesterday, uh, talking about how they, you know, don't want to get vaccinated and, and kind of pushing different conspiracy theories. So. Um, is that going to be part of this vaccine rollout? And uh, I guess how concerned are you that people in this province could choose to just not get vaccinated? Well, I would, first of all, I'd encourage anybody to get vaccinated. This is the quickest way to getting us back to a normal, a normal life that we can start doing all of the things that uh, we were doing this time last year and we were warming up for Christmas. Um, if people choose not to get the vaccine, that's that's their personal choice. There's gonna be nothing forced on them. Uh, my role is to make sure that I have the vaccine and when I get the vaccine, that I get it into people's arms as fast as possible. Lynn? Um, and since November 16th, we've had, I think, 120 healthcare workers test positive, yes. and I'm assuming that means a lot more self-isolating. Uh, this might be for <laughs> either one of you or Livingstone on the phone, um, but what kind of strain is that putting on the healthcare system, and like, where are we getting other healthcare workers from to fill all those spots? Um, I, I can maybe start and then uh, uh, maybe Scott can join in. Um, it, it is putting some pressure. Uh, we're seeing pressure from externally uh, into our healthcare system from the general public. Uh, cases that uh, Dr. Shahab just outlined, uh, certain demographics and ages of people that are coming into our healthcare system. We're also seeing people within our healthcare system get ill. Uh, and again, it's no fault of their own. This is communal transmission that we've seen on a lot of cases. But when we have uh, several nurses or several doctors go down, it causes a ripple effect with our healthcare system. Uh, the SHA has done a great job of designing contingencies that if this particular uh, unit goes down that there is backfill. That's why we're constantly adjusting what we have to do on a daily basis. If we have um, a dozen nurses that go down in um, a town of 20,000, that's that's fairly significant. We have to start pulling from other areas to be able to do that. We do have that set up, but that also creates a ripple effect of second and third um, kind of generation of people that we have to be able to backfill as well. So there is a ripple effect on that, uh, but we do have plans for all of that. It's just a matter of how quickly we can execute those plans, and so far we've been doing an extremely good job of that. I don't know if you want to add anything, Scott? So the only thing I would add is just confirm that it is a significant um, challenge for the organization as these outbreaks are occurring in our facilities with our staff and particularly as the ministers outlined, but we do work as hard as we can to backfill um, as quickly as we can. In, in some cases, services are slowed down for short periods of time because of it. And the only other thing I would mention is it's not just outbreaks that are occurring in our facility. There are outbreaks in, in partner facilities, uh, private personal care homes, and uh, in the case of the correctional facility where we also are involved and, and help is supporting that. And it's just one of the, the challenges that we're facing and one of the reasons why we continue to call uh, on the public to try to reduce contacts as much as possible. It's really that, that, that high, high level of uh, community-based transmission that is uh, bringing the disease into so many different aspects of our community. And it's so important to, to work hard as a community to try to drive that down. Follow-up question, Lynn? Yeah, like this. The SHA sent a letter to a lot of the physicians saying that they're kind of encouraging them to get training in other areas to backfill in some of those things like emergency and ICU that are maybe short sometimes. Um, and it seems like Herbert and Lanigan are losing some services because of staff redeployment. Um, so like, are there specific areas like doctors that we're seeing more of those shortages and are rural communities at risk of losing their staff to backfill that? Well, I think it's just the impact is um, immediate within rural Saskatchewan. If you only have one or two doctors in a specific uh, area and, and they go down, I mean, that's a huge impact. Whereas in the city, we have the opportunity to move people around. Uh, within rural Saskatchewan, 
<coughs> within rural Saskatchewan, we've been able to adjust and we do have to start flowing services uh, towards the larger centers uh, just because there's the opportunity to backfill there. Uh, but there are up um, where we have moved one from one city to another. We've looked at people going from Herbert to uh, potentially backfilling in Swift Current and Moose Jaw. It depends where the need is, is where we're going to allocate the people. Do we have a question on the phone? We have Lisa Schick with CJME. Hi, um, I'm wondering, uh, this is a question for uh, either the Minister or maybe uh, Mr. Livingstone. My question is on contact tracing. We're hearing a lot of things that contract, contact tracing is behind. Uh, there's a lot of work to do and not enough people to do it, that kind of thing. So why is this a problem and what's being done to fix it? Uh, <clears throat> I can start on that. Uh, the the biggest impact that's going to have on the contact tracing, which Dr. Shahab just outlined, that our contacts are going down, is uh, our bubbles that we're in. Uh, the less people that we have contact, the easier it is for people to contact tracing. Uh, we've seen surges in our numbers in our major center, obviously in Saskatoon and Regina, and we're trying to work as fast as we can to make sure that the, any positive cases that have been identified are notified within 48 hours. That's our goal, um, and we'll continue to strive to do that but depends on the day we could have a fluctuation as we, everybody is very aware of uh, anywhere from 180 up to uh, 350 up to 400 uh, people that we have to contact trace in a day and that changes things dramatically um, and then on the negative contact tracing if somebody's going back and they just and there's a negative test and we have to be able to we'll do that a little bit later on but it's more important to touch base with the people that are positive so they can react as quick as they can Follow up, Lisa? Yes, um, my other question is on school cases. Um, we are seeing a growing number of cases in schools. It seems like every day there's multiple um, reports of cases in schools. I know they're kind of dealing with that fairly well, but we've heard that it's need, there needs to be a signal from the provincial government for uh, school divisions to make the decision to go to full online learning. So I guess what are the concerns about cases in schools and at what point would the province make that decision to say uh, if the divisions want to go to online learning, then they can? Yeah, so, so I'm in regular co uh, contact with the Ministry of Education and uh, the school divisions and school divisions are regular contact with local medical health officers. So at the moment, you're right, the schools have done extremely well. Their case numbers are a reflection of high community transmission. So. We have had 212 uh, schools with a total of 347 cases so far. And of those, you know, 154 have been um, elementary, 63 high school, and 39 other. 138 have resolved with just a single case. Um, in 30 cases, there were two or more cases, uh, which was an outbreak. And in 85, you know, it's still under, um, uh, under investigation. So overall, most schools are still coming out with just a single case, and, and in many cases, the acquisition is not in the school, it's in the community. Uh, some schools, uh, uh, some large high schools are already in level three, alternate day attendance. Uh, some schools have gone to uh, online education or remote education only, and that's more for operational reasons, because if you have many classes already online, it may be easier operationally for the whole school to go online. At this point, um, you know, locally school divisions may have to uh, elect to go online on a school by school basis as dictated by, uh, you know, um, uh, operational reasons in consultation with the local medical health officer. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the government's role, I think the government, including the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education, I think is fully supporting school divisions to make whatever, uh, uh, you know, adjustments they need to. But at, at this point, again, I'd like to reiterate that schools have done extremely well, and this really speaks to uh, parents, children, teachers, staff, all complying. We've had a few situations where there's been transmission in a school bus or a classroom, uh, and especially in a school bus where mask use, for example, was not consistent. So again, we're getting really important information about all the layers being important, especially when community transmission is high, 
including consistent mask use, for example, in common areas like school buses. And so that's, again, a reminder that, you know, we all need to um, practice this behavior and, and, and model that in our homes in terms of most children now are very um, knowledgeable about mask use and how to take care of a mask and hand hygiene and physical distancing. But again, these are things that we need to continue work with our children in the home. And of course, teachers can really support children to be safe in the school setting. We'll take another question on the phone. We have Laura Sharpatelli with CBC. Uh, hi there. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, this is for Minister Merriman. Um, I'm just wondering, I, I know that there's going to be an update next week on the vaccines, but I'm just wondering if you are looking to any other uh, countries or provinces to kind of uh, have some ideas of how to carry out the distribution. Um, where are you getting your uh, kind of plans from? Um, <clears throat> We actually have a very robust plan that uh, Dr. Shahab was involved with uh, back with her H1N1 when we did uh, uh, that vaccine, acro vaccine across our province. Uh, we also have uh, one of the highest immunization rates in, in our country. So uh, I'm feeling very comfortable with, with when, how uh, we're going to distribute when the vaccine arrives. Uh, we're working with the federal government. I just talked to the federal minister uh, yesterday uh, to be able to discuss uh, the timing of that and there were working diligently with uh, at the uh, political level, but also at the, the ministry level to be able to make sure that uh, we get those vaccines and we get them distributed across the country as fast as possible. Follow-up question, Laura? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll take our next question in the room. Adam? Uh, what, uh, I know you said April or May, Dr. Shahab, for majority of the population, I think you said, can you just give people a sense of what the timeline is in your mind of when we could see most people vaccinated. I know there'll be more announcements, but uh, earliest we could see and then maybe possibly the latest and what, what they can expect uh, from what your best uh, information is right now. Yeah, so like the minister said, this is a very dynamic environment internationally, nationally, and, and for us at a provincial level. So at this point, you know, I think we are uh, very uh, happy that there is going to be uh, you know, initial rollout of at least two vaccines, uh, you know, pending licensure and approval. Um, that's the Pfizer and Moderna product. But then, you know, very quickly there may be additional vaccine candidates that are approved and and are become available. Uh, we hope certainly by uh, you know like the current vaccines that are in line and plus possibly additional vaccines certainly we uh, expect to see an increase uh, in supply towards the end of the first quarter and beginning of the second quarter like around march april and like the minister said you know we are fully uh, we have you know we vaccinate uh, over four to six weeks more than you know um, um, uh, a third of the population with influenza every year this year you know we are ready to vaccinate half the population that's a yearly program so you know we are fully equipped to be able to manage as many vaccines as we uh, get and uh, and i think in the h1n1 if you remember we had a very systematic sequenced approach and so we are uh, confident that as soon as more vaccines become available, especially towards the end of the first quarter and beginning of the second quarter, we'll be able to offer as many vaccines as we receive in, in, in real time. And that will really be important. You know, higher vaccine uptake by the population uh, in spring and early part of the summer will be key for us to come out of this pandemic. Okay, you mentioned a rebound potential in January if there were high cases, people went back to school, for example. If there are higher cases or in the same position we're in right now, would you consider recommending a longer Christmas break for schools uh, to, to not send kids or teachers back into classrooms, or is that something that would be considered or, or no? Yeah, so, you know, again, this has been an active area of discussion with our colleagues and partners in the Ministry of Education and, and the school divisions. Um, right now, obviously, teachers um, and schools feel very, um, and they're right that they feel uh, very strongly that the best place, place for children is school. We've seen the benefits of in-class learning in the fall. And uh, so at the moment, the plan is to have a regular uh, school break. Obviously, for some high schools, they are already in hybrid learning. A few schools have gone online for a couple of weeks. So we'll continue to see that if there's any additional benefit of extending the, the winter break. But at this point, it, it appears that you know, it'll be a regular two-week break um, and, and, and start regular start of school out in January. Do you think this, the, the fact that schools haven't seen transmission 
uh, and the kids have been wearing masks, teachers have been wearing masks, we're doing all the physical distancing, hand washing. Is that a validation that a mask use and following the public health can, can be uh, effective because schools have been fairly successful in not having cases and transmission within schools? Yeah, I think all the layers have been important. So not going to school if you're sick, uh, staying home, um, seeking testing, and then isolation, both uh, a case and contacts. Uh, being in a fixed cohort in, in a classroom. And so again, I think schools have done a lot of efforts, elementary, but especially high schools, in minimizing uh, and uh, having a smaller cohort. Uh, and then, of course, mask use. We've already seen evidence that where mask use slips, we do see clusters in, in, for example, the school bus situation. So I think all these layers have been extremely important. And again, you know, the more I look at it, at, I think the, the school numbers have been well below what my expectation was. So again, it speaks to uh, the innovation and resiliency of uh, you know, teachers and staff and, and, and parents and students. We'll take our last question on the phone. We have Brian Zinchuk with Glacier Media. Dr. Shaw, using the uh, seven-day averages, North Dakota peaked on November 14th, 18 days ago, and has since cut their cases by half from over 1,389 down to 673. Manitoba, at the same time, plateaued around the 11th of November and for 22 days has been essentially flat. In the same period, Saskatchewan has essentially more than doubled its numbers and we're now at 274 per day average. So why are we still growing when the others are not? Yeah, thanks for that. And um, so on a positive note, um, our epidemiology and modeling is showing that the, uh, the additional measures announced on 19 November are having an impact. And instead of having seeing 400, 500 cases a day, we are seeing around that 250 on average a day. So that's on a positive note. But we also know that, and, 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 and we'll be looking at the impact of the further measures announced on November 27th. We have some early indications of some impact on that and slowing transmission, but we'll know more by next week uh, because it takes up to a week or two weeks for any additional measures to have an impact. So, you know, th this week and early next week is going to be critical because that will tell us are the measures on November 27th enough and what do they, uh, you know, forecast for the holidays. Um, because there is a one to two week lag for case counts and then a three to four week lag for ICU and hospital session. But even if we plateau at 250 cases a day, that's still very high. That's still 250 cases a day for a sustained period of time still puts too much pressure on uh, on the hospital and acute care uh, and ICU system. So we do want that to start trending down. Uh, but I think um, even if we all practice everything consistently, which we all should now, uh, it'll take us a week or two to see that downward trend. But absolutely, you know, we would like to see this plateau and um, uh, trend down before we hit even 300, and certainly not go as high as um, you know some other jurisdictions have seen. Follow-up question, Brian. Yeah, the modeling that you released two weeks ago uh, had a forecast model, and again, this is a model. But said by November 29th, we were looking at a range of between 660 and 2,100 new cases per day, with the midpoint being over 1,300 cases per day. And in reality, we have trended much, much lower than that. Like you said, around 250, and we're well below the blue band we saw on that hockey stick curve. So can you speak to how effectively that has made a difference? Yeah, so obviously uh, the modeling projects everything, including scenarios that would be unacceptable. So I think the whole purpose of the fact that we are in, uh, in our 10th month of the pandemic and working so hard, every Saskatchewan resident, every business, uh, the uh, healthcare system, the reason we've been working so hard is that none of us wants to see the worst case or even the you know the pessimistic or the mid-range scenario. We don't want to go there. Because you know some jurisdictions in the world have seen that, and that has been totally devastating. So we really want to stay in the blue or green area, um, and that's why we, uh, you know, um, we can argue that you know should we push harder earlier, 
or should we wait a bit? But you know, the fact that we have been taking action over the last two weeks with more specific restrictions that obviously put some hardship that you know we can't play in sports teams. We have to go in a more systematic way for um, for retail. We have to be more thoughtful if we visit, visit a restaurant. Obviously, there's some hardships, but they are, um, I, I think, very acceptable compared to the 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 the, the uh, impact if we didn't have these. So again, I think at the moment uh, things are trending, starting trend in the right way. But we need to be very consistent, and we all need to practice this because again, if just a few people don't practice this, that adds to hundreds of cases a day. And so I think, again, that, that's the, the message that we all need to be very consistent and diligent with doing all the measures that are in place right now. And with that, thanks everyone. That concludes today's update. Thank you. Thank you.